Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. RTX 40 is due to launch next year, of course, utilizing TSMC's 5NM process for GPUs such as AD102, which will power the RTX 4090 and so on. Now, yeah, the dies for this are gigantic because they are monolithic, but Lovelace will be followed with Hopper. And Hopper, well, as you probably guessed, is not monolithic. It's going to be a chiplet design, much like RDNA 3. Now, it's very early in the leak stages for, well, not only RDNA 3, but of course Hopper, to know how the two designs really differ from one another. But there is a fascinating patent which has actually been discovered by Underfox. I'll link his Twitter account in the video description. Now, while of course we don't get a full overview of the Hopper design, we can get probably an understanding of what we might see from some of the SKUs. Now, the patent's name, it's a, it's a, it just rolls off the tongue. Face-to-face -to -face dies with enhanced power delivery using extended TS. These. And of course, the applicant here is the NVIDIA Corporation, and you can see as well the inventors on screen. So basically, this is a very interesting power delivery method You from one die to another. Basically, the two dies are smushed together. Smush is a very complicated engineering term, just for those wondering. And basically, power is provided from, let's say, die A, as you can see in the diagrams here. Oh, God. Uh, from the from the diagrams here and then it's basically passed on to the second die using extended TSVs or through silicon vias This basically means that you can have a smaller footprint and it has several other benefits as well Now there are some other questions of course including cooling methods for the two chips and what the actual cooler would look like but yeah, Hopper is going to be a very different, radically different design actually from NVIDIA's previous architectures. And obviously chiplets have a lot of benefits, not least of which, well, it reduces the cost and allows you to more customize the design. But there are a ton of other benefits, just the fact that you can actually build a more powerful GPU. In fact, there were a couple of um, you know, experiments that NVIDIA were running and actually published regarding this that you can create a larger chiplet-based design that's way more powerful than any such design that you could create with a monolithic kind of footprint. And yeah, there are certainly more challenges in some ways with designing a chiplet-based architecture. For example, just actually getting all of the GPUs to kind of harmonize data and stuff. And there's a ton of actual patents for that that you can kind of do some Googling about with uh, AMD, for example. But it's in a very smart way to make power and just you know, efficiency such a thing in the future. I mean, there's a really good reason, of course, that AMD are embracing this so heavily with, well, pretty much all of their products now. We know that MI200 is going to be a chiplet design, RDNA3, at least Navi31 and 32 anyway, are going to be a chiplet design. <laughs> well, yeah, we all know about the CPUs. So Hopper, to me, it's going to be very interesting to see what the actual differences are in terms of performance for the uh, architecture versus what we have with RTX 40. As RTX 40, aka Lovelace, is said to be over two times increased. I'm hearing maybe 2.2 or even faster, maybe even 2.4. Personally, I'm erring on the side of caution and saying a 2.2 times increase over RTX 3090. I want to briefly touch on some interesting Intel XC news for Alchemist. Now, Alchemist, for those who have not really been keeping up with the news, is basically Intel's DG2. Basically, it's had a cooler name associated with it. And the performance targets for this now are widely expected to be around RTX 3070. It's been something I've been hearing for quite some time, and apparently leaked internal documents have basically put it to that kind of performance. And apparently, we're going to see these GPUs launch kind of late this year, or more realistically, around CES. That's when the general consensus is that we're going to see these cards launch at CES. And there is a lot of interesting technology that's being plowed into this. Obviously, it supports stuff like ray tracing, but we also have Intel's XESS, which is basically super sampling. We'll discuss more about that side of things in a moment because Rajar Kodori has actually provided a small update. But I also want to discuss their decision to use, well, TSMC. So the over-reliance of TSMC in the industry is something that's been talked about to death at this point, so I won't belabor the point too much. 
We're fairly certain that Nvidia will be using TSMC's 5NM process for Lovelace. And obviously at the moment, Nvidia are using Samsung for its Ampere architecture. But yeah, Intel can actually manufacture its own GPUs. So what gives? Why did Intel decide to use TSMC? Well, it's kind of an ironic reason, it's capacity. When pressed about this, Rajar said, and I quote, it was necessary to first determine the manufacturing capacity of the process that can be assumed at the start of the design. And Intel's advanced processes did not have sufficient capacity yet. Reading between the lines, basically what Raja is saying here is that they were not uh, basically confident that Intel's uh, higher performance nodes would be able to produce silicon in high enough capacities or at least at decent enough yields to be able to offer them enough product on store shelves and instead they felt it was better to go with essentially a competitor here. I think it makes sense honestly from Intel's point of view. It'll be very interesting though in future architectures whether they stick with TSMC or whether they decide to well use their own processes. Now, obviously, Intel are plowing a ton of money into its own manufacturing plants and stuff at the moment. And I guess we can only wait and see just how successful it is because, well, there's still a lot of, let's say, skepticism around how well its advanced nodes perform. Obviously, there's been, you know, Skylake Forever 14 NM Forever as well memes. But I do have some level of confidence in Intel going forward. Also, while we're on the subject of Intel XE, uh, Raja has also said, by the way, regarding the super sampling technique, XESS, it's said that it's backwards compatible. In other words, DG1 that has been released can also use XESS, and it would also work on the 11th generation GPUs, including Tiger Lake. Now, obviously, it's a little bit different for those architectures because they don't support the same instructions as what we have with, let's say, Alchemist. So it's going to utilize the fallback features, to my understanding. So this would be a little bit like if you're running on a competitor GPU, such as, let's say, a GeForce RTX 20, then it would do much the same thing rather than using DP4A instructions. And final piece of news for today, and it's both a bittersweet symphony of GPU news. So clearly prices and availability for graphics cards has been up in the air recently. In fact, it's not been so great the past month or so. However, it had been getting better for some time. There's an interesting report over at 3D Center where we've seen GPU prices increase by several percent but availability go down just a little bit. I won't read out all of the numbers here because quite frankly, I think you can see them on screen and I'll also link the 3D Center article in the video description because I find it rather telling. But yeah, basically prices for certain cards in particular has gone up considerably. For example, the MSRP is basically just not being observed for pretty much anything. We see the RX 6600 XT go up to 500 euros. In fact, at the moment, it's even trending closer to 600 euros. And obviously, that's a huge increase over the official price, which is just under 400 euros. I think it's like 380 if memory serves, or was it 369? I can't remember exactly. But yeah, basically, it's gone up considerably. However, while all of that might sound awful and it's not exactly great, there is some light at the end of the tunnel and it's going to come to us next year. So yeah, basically next year is going to be the launch, of course, of RDNA 3, RTX 40, and so on and so on. But there is also something else which is happening with all of this, and that is a ton of money is going into the manufacturing of, well, manufacturing plants. Now, clearly, when you're breaking ground for a fab, it's not like, oh, that's it, it's done. It takes a number of years, not only for the building of the fab, but then you actually have to get it up and running and then manufacturing the uh, whatever well, whatever chips you're uh, producing and this actually takes some fine tuning it's quite a complicated process and well outside the remit of this video to really discuss but what is important is that this has been going on for some time and there have been a ton of different commitments from multiple different companies including intel for plowing a ton of resources into this and honestly it makes sense now, I'm going to link a very interesting article in the video description, and it is from the IDC. I'm going to read the headline for you. Semiconductor market to grow by 17.3% in 2021 and reach potential overcapacity by 2023. So the IDC expects the, se the semiconductor market to grow by about 17% uh, for this year 
versus 10% or 11%, I guess, in 2020. However, according to the IDC, the industry will see, quote, normalization and balance by the middle of 2022, insert uh, Thanos meme here, with the potential for overcapacity in 2023 as larger scale capacity extensions begin to come online towards the end of 2022. Now, now basically overcapacity is pretty simple. It means that you're basically able to produce more than what your customers demand. And this, of course, is excellent timing, given that we're going to see the launch of a crap ton of new products over the next several months going into next year, not least of which RDNA 3 and obviously CDNA as well is being really popular right now. AMD are also going to be continuing to plow out tons of its CPUs and, well, NVIDIA as well will also be using TSMC. So I do have some level of optimism going forward. I do think that, you know, supply constraints are going to probably start to get better. It isn't just the manufacturing of the components itself, like the actual GPU die that's been the problem. To my understanding, substrate has been a really big issue, particularly with certain areas. But yeah, I do think it is getting better. The thing is, I've spoken to several AIBs and kind of others under the table a couple of times regarding supply. And while no one wants to comment officially for obvious reasons, you know, it's like the TLDR is that they say that, you know, especially at the height of like the mining craze or just in general, to be honest with you, just, you know, when a new card is launched, just gamers want it so damn much that they could produce two or three or even four times the number of cards and they would still probably sell out. In fact, I was told by one AIB that one of the cards from the NVIDIA lineup, I believe it was the 3060 Ti. I don't remember if it's the 3060 Ti or the 3070. I'll say the 3060 Ti, but I could be getting them too mixed up. I was told that they actually thought they might have enough for a couple of days of stock. <laughs> just like, nope, it went. And I think that this is just kind of the way forward for the foreseeable future. And I know it's really frustrating, but I do think that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, probably for next year. And it'll be very interesting because if people don't manage to pick up an RTX 3080, just for example, or a RX 6800 XT, by the end of this year, at the end of the day, it could prompt people just to say, okay, screw it. I'm going to stick with the card that I've got right now. Or it might even offer Intel a way in, depending on what the supply is for their GPUs. Now, obviously, the, the best case scenario for Intel here is that cards such as the 3060 Ti or the 3070 or the 6700 XT or whatever are still in major, major, major shortages, but they have a crap ton of whatever Alchemist GPUs they're going to launch. That would be a you know an ideal scenario. But to be honest with you, what the numbers of cards they have available, who the hell knows at this point? It'll be really interesting to see how Intel takes advantage of this in the market going forward. But I do think that supply is going to start getting better by midpoint of next year. I know it just sucks though, but. Yeah, um, I do know a number of people, however, that have been quite successful picking up cards. And what I've noticed, and this is anecdotal, so do let me know in the comments below if you've had any success. But a couple of friends have actually had more luck in actually going into stores. Now, this is certainly not always the case, and it is definitely pot luck. But uh, And this is, by the way, not sponsored. I want to stress, this is just me trying to help out. And if it's wrong, incorrect... Don't blame me. But I know a couple of people who have picked up um, in Canada. One of my friends picked up an RTX 3070. And another picked up a 3090, I think it was, from Canada Computers. They managed to pick one up. I believe that they were giving, like, kind of a certain allotment of cards. Like, you could only have one or two per customer based on your credit card or something like that. And there was, like, a whole thing with my friend in Texas. I think he grabbed one from micro center or something like that so let me know guys how what what type of luck have you actually had for like physical brick and mortar stores as well it'll be interesting to get that comment chain going with that said thanks very much for checking out the video if you've enjoyed it you know what to do i'll see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now